Hi everyone, my name is Angie and I'm here with Clara from New Ventures BC and um, welcome. And we're with uh, Ling Wong and Roger Kuypers from Baskin and we're gonna talk about managing your intellectual property today. Um, first, for those in the competition, uh, it is the day we will share results. So we're just finalizing that as well, but you'll probably get an email late, late afternoon um in terms of the results of the competition because i know uh, many people of you are waiting uh otherwise let's jump into uh the session today so of course want to acknowledge that new ventures bc is situated on the ancestral unceded territory of the uh, coast salish peoples including the musqueam squamish and the sligo tooth first nations and we're very grateful for that uh our sponsors they, they are the reason why we get to do this, and this is our 24th year, so the sponsors are very important. So Innovate PC is our title sponsor. Our gold sponsors are EY, Baskin, who, who is uh, part of their support is all the great education sessions we're able to tap into. Uh, National Bank. Silver sponsors include Nantec Angel Network, SFU Beatty School, UBC Solder School, Talk Shop Media, and RBCX. And then we have lots of great uh, community sponsors um, that support us at the bronze level. And these are all great organizations and media to check out as well. Otherwise, a couple more things. We have a few more events coming up. So we will be talking about pitch and storytelling next Friday. Uh, so this will be with our partners at Volition who work with a lot of startup companies and have some great tips on how to better communicate your, 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 uh, your value proposition. Uh, and the event will be hybrid, so if you're in Vancouver, please do join us. Actually, I think we're having the event at Baskin, so welcome to, to join us in person there, and um, or online as well. So we'll have options for you for that. We also have another session coming up around HR 101 for startups. So things, to th things and practical tips to think about as a startup as you're starting to build your team. And that's uh, June 11th. Uh, and that will be a webinar, so we'll see you online for that one. Otherwise, that's about it for housekeeping. So today's event is around managing your intellectual property and introducing you to things, uh, you know, things that we hope startups uh, need to know when it comes to their competitive advantage and where IP fits there. This is also a great uh, way for me to lead in that it's um, good time with the other program we run, which is called Accelerate IP, and that's to support startups with education, uh, additional education, I should say, mentorship opportunities, and then funding supports for your IP strategy and your IP implementation. So that program is at accelerateip.ca, and you can definitely get more information on that as well. Otherwise, oh, no, we're not at thank you yet, are we? So I'm going to stop sharing, <laughs> and uh, I will uh, pass it over to, I believe Roger will start, but Roger Kuypers and Ling Wong are here from Baskin, and they will take you through all the intellectual property concepts for the day. Thanks, Angie. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. We're off to the races. Mm -hmm. After 24 years, we're getting pretty good at this. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about uh, intellectual property today. And... Uh, just Switch over here. Wouldn't be a legal um, presentation without a disclaimer. So what we're really saying here is if you want me to translate from legalese is um, kind of know what we're talking about. Um, we're going to get most of it right. Some of it may be wrong. You've been warned. So let's talk about what intellectual property is first um, and what makes it different. Uh, it's uh, obviously it has an intellectual component. So what does that mean? It represents intellectual efforts and achievements and it, a broad, broad scope of subject matter. So a writing of software, books, screenplays in the world of trademarks with got brands, logos, um, product and company names, business plans, formula, formulae uh, or formulas, I don't know, uh, recipes, business processes, and then entering into the world of ideas and inventions, uh, new drugs, electronics, goods, manufacturing processes, all sorts of things all of which come from here, uh, making it intellectual, as opposed to dirt, real estate, or, um, or inventory, or those types of assets. And so what does the property part mean? Well, in this particular instance, because these things are mainly intangible, the property part really means it's a bundle of rights uh, that you have with respect to those 
intellectual property assets. So you have the right uh, to um, use the technology, the right to uh, the intellectual property, the right to prevent others from doing so. And importantly, and in a way that's super scalable compared to other uh, types of intellectual, sorry, other types of property, um, you can license to others and, and often infinitely if you look at um, like going back to the streaming of music or whatever, you could have that, you, you record it once, you put it up, it exists, it's intangible and millions of people can listen to it. So why is intellectual property protection important? Um, well, there's a number of reasons. Um, think of it as a very valuable commercial asset. In fact, for most companies, their intellectual property um, for, for many uh, companies, their, their IP assets are their most valuable. And, and I'll, demo, I'll, I'll illustrate that uh, briefly. But um, intellectual property provides a competitive advantage uh, sometimes. If, if you look at the example of the LG um, OLED, so Samsung was for a while the king of TVs and, or the queen of TVs. And um, along comes LG, they develop the um, OLED, which is the best um, picture that you can have in the world, but it was patented. And so if you wanted to have the best picture, you either bought um, an LG TV or you bought it from one of the companies that they sold the panels to. So for example, Sony had OLEDs, and, and, but that's just because they bought the panels from LG and they put their own electronics on it. And so um, that for quite a while, and largely thanks to the patent protection, um, is a market that they created and that others can enter. And so that's an enormous uh, uh, you know, competitive advantage. Uh, another reason to why IP protection is important, and that's particularly um, for the startup companies, is that it's very important to investors and, um, and potential acquirers. And so what happens is, you know, here at Faskin, we've got a, a large emerging technology practice. And, and the most fun part is working with companies like your companies um, and helping them grow and protecting their IP. But uh, sometimes uh, we work for the VCs or private equity or large companies that are acquiring um, smaller companies like yours. And when we do that, and one of the things that Ling and I do is we help with uh, due diligence. And so they'll send us into the data room and they'll make sure, and they'll make us do searches, patent searches, trademark searches. They'll look at, they'll have us look at your employment agreements. They'll have us look at your contractor agreements. And they're gonna want us to answer questions about intellectual property. Does the company really own it? Um, what are the risks out there? Does the, does the intellectual property infringe? These are, are questions and these are issues that make or break deals. And so we're often um, in the course of these, you know, if it's a financing, it could be 10, 30, 100 million. If it's an acquisition, it, it, it is sometimes in the hundreds of millions. And, and we've had deals that have just gone sideways because the IP um, T's were not crossed, the I's were not dotted. And because of that, um, the purchaser or the investor um, walked away. So uh, that's why IP protection is important. It's important to get it right. Um, but the thing to bear in mind about IP is that um, it's very vulnerable. It's easy to copy and to steal and to counterfeit, um, unlike a more traditional types of, of property. I mean, you can't counterfeit or uh, copy land. You can certainly steal it, um, hence the acknowledgement at the beginning of the uh, presentation. But, uh, but that aside, IP is very vulnerable. And, and so there are different ways we need to protect it. So getting to the value of IP, and I promised to illustrate it. So what you see here is a slide that represents the relative value of intangible assets to tangible assets on average among the S&P 500 companies over time. And so the tangible assets are buildings and equipment, cash and bonds, inventory, land, the intangible assets are primarily intellectual property. We're talking about patents, um, brands, customer data, software. 
things that are intellectual property or are primarily protected by intellectual property. And what you can see is that if you go back to 1975, only 17% of the asset value of the S&P 500 on average was attributable to intangible assets. But fast forward to 2020, fully 90% on average of the assets of the S&P 500 were intangible assets. And that I, I can almost, I can't almost, I can't imagine it going much higher than 90%. Um, but uh, but I, I suspect it hasn't gone down since uh, 2020. So um, IP management, we're going to talk about the four main types of intellectual property. I'm going to introduce copyrights and trademarks, and then Ling is going to talk about the two types of intellectual property that protect ideas, which are trade secrets and patents. And so there's a few things we're going to focus on, and these are are, are, are important and hopefully somewhat interesting. Um, we're going to focus on uh, identifying the uh, IP. So hopefully we will help if you if you're not IP experts already, um, we'll help you understand the difference between the copyright and the trademark and the patent and the trade secret. And um, and then we're also going to focus on ownership. Ownership in intellectual property is not intuitive. It is not often what we expect it should be or what even it full stop should be. And we'll get into that a bit because that is um, it's a challenge that that our clients face and that startup companies face. And it's something that can be addressed and it isn't complicated to address. It's important to address, but it's easy to overlook. And then finally, we'll talk a bit about steps you can take to protect different types of IP. And so as we're going through this, and I'll, I'll ask for the hosts to help monitor the hands up and all that. We'd like this to be interactive. It's more interesting that way. Um, there will be uh, times in the presentation when you'll have questions. And so please put up your digital hand and then we'll see if we can um, try to answer those questions. So I'm going to start with copyright. So what is it? Well, it's the sole right to produce or reproduce a work or a substantial part of a work. And we'll tell you what a work is. That's the word that's used in the Copyright Act, and we'll explain what it is. But this is a really important part of understanding copyright. It protects the expression of an idea, not the ideas themselves. So if I have an idea of a song where someone loses their job, their dog runs away, and, the, and, and their spouse leaves him or her, um, that would, that's, that's, a, that's just an idea. But there's no copyright in that. If I was um, cool enough to actually write the song, create lyrics, and create, create music, and write them down, um, at that point, we've gone from the idea bad, trite idea as it is, and we've expressed it in the form of music and in the form of lyrics, and then write it down. So um, we'll get to the fixed part of the requirement. That's what copyright protects. Ling's going to talk about protecting ideas because that's the world of patents and trademarks, but copyright is the expression of ideas. So what are those expressions of ideas? Well, they include a work, from the Copyright Act includes articles, photographs, graphic design, study protocols, if you're in the world of research, uh, data, computer programs, so software, uh, website designs. These are all things that are protected by copyright. And so we'll, we have some examples there. But one of the things to, um, to understand is that you can have something protected by copyright that comprises a number of works. So if you look at the screen capture from Life Sciences BC, um, you've got uh, the Life Sciences BC uh, logo, you've got some text here, you've got a photograph, and then you've got the overall layout. And then in the bottom here, you've got a number of designs um, that are logos. And each one of those is a work, each element, and this whole assembly, the compilation of those works is also itself a work. So that's what copyright protects. So what are the requirements for copyright? What do you need for copyright to exist? 
Well, I'll start with the easy one first, and that is it needs to be in fixed form. So if you were to go to a hockey game and you were to see um, three periods of people skating and all that, um, copyright wouldn't protect that. That's something that occurs in a moment and is gone. But if you were to take a, a video of that, and you'll see if you watch a hockey game and at the end, they sometimes have a copyright notice. Um, the recording of that is fixed. And at that point, you've taken something that's kind of ethereal and, and occurs for a moment and then passes and you've put it in fixed form. That's what fixed form means. Like I said about the bad song is you take that idea and if you write it down, um, then writing down either the, the music or the lyrics or both, that satisfies the requirement. So you're halfway there. So what's the second requirement of copyright? And it's generally referred to as originality. And there is some variation. Um, most countries in the world are a party to um, an international treaty that recognizes and establishes copyrights. And it's, it's quite old. It dates back to the 1800s. And so there's some variation of this concept of originality. But in Canada, it means this. But what, in order to be protected by copyright, um, something needs to be more than another copy of a work. It needs to reflect the exercise of skill and judgment, but not necessarily creativity. And so the reason why we have um, at the bottom left corner of your screen is something that um, some of you may, some of you that are older like me would recognize as the white pages. Um, and it used to be before the internet, if you wanted to call someone and find their number, there was no internet. So you would, um, you had these big books, these multi-page volumes that, um, um, that you would receive from the phone company every year. And they would have um, lists of names alphabetically and then addresses and phone numbers. And that's what you would use. And there was a case called the Teledirect case quite a while ago in Canada that established the benchmark for this test. And the court held that uh, it wasn't enough to just list names alphabetically. That wasn't enough skill and judgment. And uh, so that, so, so if you go beyond that, generally speaking in Canada, you've probably met that case. And certainly um, something like a Starry Night would, uh, would certainly entail the exercise of skill uh, and judgment sufficient to for something to be a work. So you meet that test, originality and fixed form, and you've got copyright. And good news for you and the bad news for lawyers is that's about it. Um, copyright, most of our clients don't register copyright. You can register copyright. There are some benefits, but they're quite slight. This is the area of intellectual property um, where the benefit you get from registration um, is not really much better, except in very limited ways, than what you just get automatically. So don't spend a bunch of money on copyright registration. Save that for your patents and trademarks. So um, I mentioned at the beginning that there are certain concepts in intellectual property law related to ownership that are not intuitive. And here's one, and and it's it's actually kind of weird. It's called moral rights. And so we have in our um, Copyright Act uh, the concept of moral rights. It doesn't exist in the U.S. There are some countries that have rights that are somewhat analogous, somewhat similar. But generally speaking, um, the moral right is the right of the author to the integrity of the work. So, okay, well, that, uh, that begs a couple of questions. Who's an author? So the author of a copyright is the person who actually expresses the idea. So if it's, if it's software, it's the person that actually writes the code. If it's data, it's the person, if you're looking at a clinical trial, for example, it's the person that recorded the data. It's not the, the person who came up with the study, for software, it's not the person who came up with the idea. It's actually the person that codes it because copyright is the expression of the idea. And so moral rights um, are part of that that are owned by the authors. And so what you see in the left hand, sorry, the right hand part of the screen is a picture of the uh, atrium at the Eaton Center in Toronto. 
Not sure if they still call it the Eaton Center um, because Eaton Eaton's is a department store that closed quite some time ago. But anyways, um, what you see is not um, not uh, Alfred Hitchcock, the birds. That's not a, a, a bunch of birds attacking people in the mall. It's actually um, uh, a, a number of sculptures of Canada geese that are suspended um, from the ceiling of the atrium. And what happened one Christmas was that the owners of the mall thought it would be a good idea, or the operators of the mall, to uh, decorate the geese with uh, Christmas decorations. And so they did so. And then what ha happened was um, the artist, the artist who actually uh, was paid for this, the artist who sold these sculptures and, and no longer owns them, um, objected to that, sent a letter, said, you know, this is my art, remove the, the decorations. And uh, the mall owner or operator said no. And so the, uh, the artist, the sculptor, uh, went to court and got an order for them to remove the decorations. And so because part of moral rights and part of this idea of the integrity of the work is that you're not allowed to modify the work because that infringes someone's moral rights. Now, this all seems very esoteric. And you may, you may be wondering, like, uh, what does that have to do with, with, with my company and what we're doing? Well, if your company is a software company um, and you have someone who codes for you, whether it's an employee or a contractor, and they don't waive their moral rights, then any bug fixes, new versions, updates, that's all an infringement of moral rights because that's a modification of their work. And if you have, if you hire someone to create a website uh, for your company and they did an okay job, but then you decided that you're going to use someone else the next time around and that someone else is going to take your original website and update it, make some changes. If the person who created your original website didn't waive their moral rights, then that would be an infringement of their moral rights. And arguably they can go off to court and they can make you stop. And they can say, and your website developer can say, you know, you, there's no waiver of moral rights. If you're not going to use us for the update, you can start from scratch. So you can appreciate that, that a concept, that, you know, the integrity of, of a work that made sense within the context of artistic expressions has now grafted itself onto um, expressions that are still somewhat artistic but are fundamentally commercial in nature and so that is uh, it's not good it's complicated so the one that but it's very simple to address so for example in your employment agreement uh, you would have a statement that says the employee shall and does hereby waive all of his or her moral rights in the work product moral rights are waived you can't assign them they can only belong to a human being and so if you ever see uh, an agreement that says, oh, I'm going to sign my moral rights, that's just legally wrong. It's the author of the work needs to waive those rights, and then they go away. And that's all you need. If, you, if you're using a company to do some coding for you, a bond contract, what you would do then is you would have a provision in the agreement saying that the company um, shall ensure that all of the people who you know create the software waive their moral rights. And that's not the same as the waiver. Um, when we uh, we when we do due diligence for uh, financings, well, more major financings and acquisitions, we will sometimes um, be in a situation where a condition of the closing of that financing or acquisition is tracking down those people, the people, the coders. Um, it, you know, if it's a, particularly if it's a software company. Um, to get moral rights waivers. And you can imagine that if they are no longer employees, if you've part of company, in particular, if you've part of company under you know unhappy circumstances, there could be a price to be paid uh, for that, uh, obtaining that waiver, if, if they even agree to provide that waiver. So that's a pitfall that um, isn't commonly understood, but it's something to avoid. I see we have a few chats in there. Did I miss any questions or are we good to keep barreling along? No, you're good to keep going. Okay. 
So uh, case study, let's say um, this is old news by now, but you know, 10, 20 years ago, this was kind of a new thing. The parking app. I don't know if you remember, but there used to be people that would be sit there at the parking lot and you'd go and you pay if you look when you left the parking lot. Um, those people have moved on to other employment, hopefully, or retired and are sitting somewhere on a beach in Mexico, I hope. Um, but uh, what we have now are parking apps. And so let's say that you, um, you're going to be in the New Ventures competition and your idea is a parking app. And we're going to New Ventures in the early days of New Ventures. So we're going back 24 years. And um, so you come up with the idea and you start a company um, and then you, uh, uh, you have someone, an employee, or you hire someone who's the software architect. And the software architect says, well, you know, we need, um, we need a payment section, right? We need the, that module. We need the identity module and then the module where they identify their cars or their, uh, their, their license plate number. And well, that's, that's the plan. And then you go, the company goes and hires a coder to code it. And um, everybody gets paid. The, the coder gets paid. The software architect gets paid. And, um, and you came up with the idea. You started the company. So you got a bunch of shares for assigning the idea to the company. So you've been paid to. So who owns the app? Let's say that there are no agreements that deal with copyright. Maybe there's agreements saying, you'll do this. Fine. I agree to do it. You're going to pay me X. You pay, you pay X. Um, but let's say that the agreements are silent on intellectual property. Who owns the app? The coder. The coder working under contract because of copyright law owns the copyright to the code that they didn't think of, that they didn't design, but that they coded. And so, um, so ownership as a general rule, the author of a work is the first owner of copyright. And so uh, the good news for people who have employees that are coding or otherwise creating works is that if you're employed uh, and if and if what you create is 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 made in the course of your work, then your employer does own the copyright to that. Now, Moral rights don't happen automatically for employees, so you still need that in your, your employment agreement. But if you, as is so often the case for companies that don't want the um, burn rate of having a lot of uh, employees, if you're using external uh, parties to code and to do other, uh, the creation of um, works that are used in your business, um, you only own that uh, you only own what they create if there are words of assignment in the agreement. And so it's not just something that says, oh, the parties agree that the company's going to own everything. That's Well, that's kind of there, but what you really need is a statement that says um, that uh, the contractor shall and does hereby assign to the company all of his or her rights, title, and interest in and to the deliverables. Now, you could probably have something a little simpler. You don't have to say in and to, and you don't always have to say rights, title, and interest, um, but you need that word, those words of assignment in order for that to have occurred. And that's something else that uh, we sometimes have to chase down in order to facilitate the closing of a financing or an acquisition, is to find those people and have them sign assignments. And so it's uh, really critical to get that right. As I mentioned before, copyright protection arises automatically um, and you can register, but the, the enhancement of the rights is, is quite slight. It's something that people sometimes do before going to court um, because if you, don't, uh, if you don't have a copyright registration, then one of the things you'll have to do if you sue someone for copyright infringement is to establish that you have copyrights, which would entail filing some evidence of you know, where something was created and who created it. Um, but if you register that copyright, then you have um, this certificate that's like a prima facie evidence of, uh, of uh, ownership of copyright. Um, you'll see circle C um, notations next to particular things. You can embed that in code. If you have photographs, you can put, you know, 
The marketing people always hate the Circle C because it kind of wrecks the aesthetics of things, but it does have some legal effect. It's not absolutely necessary. The legal effect it does have is that if you put the Circle C and then you put the name of the owner, the year it was first published, and then you'll say something like all rights reserved, that will make it even more difficult for someone that you're suing for copyright infringement to say, I didn't know it was protected by copyright. I didn't know who owned it. I thought I had a license to use it. So that's what that notation is all about when you see that. So to sum up on copyrights, copyright management, uh, focus on ownership and rights. Remember, uh, these things aren't as intuitive as, as perhaps they should be. And so you, what you want to do is you want to make sure that your contracts for the creation of any works um, have the magic sentence. And so I've provided a magic sentence. So this one uh, says, contractor shall and does hereby assign to customer all rights, title, and interests in and to the deliverables and shall ensure that each author of the deliverables waives all of his or her moral rights in and to the deliverables. So with that one sentence in the contract that you use with your external coder or your website developer or someone that's providing graphic designs that you're going to use in your business or maybe is writing copy that you're going to use in, in collateral or that you're going to use in your website, this should address the ownership issue and the moral rights issue. Any questions before we move on? Uh, you addressed most of them. Uh, one just popped up here. How do copyright rules, this is from Charlie, how do copyright rules apply to works contributed by individuals in the context of open source software projects? Uh, very, very important subject. Um, what you have to look at, so there is copyright in open source because uh, the code is uh, certainly requires the exercise of skill and judgment or, you know, or either, and um, it's in fixed form. So it's protected by copyright. And uh, what you need to look at with open source, and this is also a big part of um, due diligence from if you're dealing with companies for whom they have a significant um, open, uh, sorry, software component is there's um there's good open source and there's bad open source. And so the good open source is um, Apache and Cisco products and, and all sorts of code that you can use where the terms and conditions of using that code don't require very much of you. You really just get to use it for free and you don't have to do, um, there aren't owner's conditions. The bad code, which is referred to in contracts, is often referred to as copy left. And it's part of a different, perhaps ideologically motivated movement within the coding community where uh, the sharing part is the same, but there are strings attached. And the strings that are attached to copy left are things like you need, you can use this open source, but then you have to give your software away for free, which is not a good business proposition. Um, sometimes it's, you can use this open source, but you need to share your source code with the world. Also not a very good term. And so we actually had a situation a number of years ago where a company was about to launch a software company, prominent software company, uh, was about to launch uh, a new um, app and they had us do a review of um, the open source terms and conditions. They had a list of open source that was used and it had a bunch of copy left in it, copy left. They ended up delaying the launch by a year and, and the year they took taking those copy left modules and rewriting them from scratch. And so, um, yeah, that is, it's definitely a big pitfall. It's of course, very uh, tempting because it's a shortcut, right? You know, you need, you need this module, you need this module, well, there are a couple of them online and we can use them for free and put them in and we're off to the races. But so what you need to do is you just need to look at the terms. Um, it's some, it often embedded in the code itself are the terms pursuant to which you, the license 
to the to the open source and so that's what you review and if it all looks fine then then it's probably safe to use it but if it starts talking about sharing the code and disclosing your source code and all that you know that that's um it's not something you want to do Okay, a couple more. Uh, can you comment on developer comments within the code itself when it comes to copyright protection? So as an example, if developers are marking all the code with copyright protection tags, does that help? Um, well, I, I see that as two questions. So first of all, the developer comments. So I don't know if they're REM statements or whatever, but call them in the olden days, but it's been a long time since I coded. But um, they um, are protected by copyright because they are expressions of ideas. And in this case, they're expressions which are in the form of comments regarding the code and how the code works and, and all that. Um, copyright notations, um, if you have commentary regarding copyright in the code itself, then that may serve as a copyright notice. I mean, that's quite common. You'll have a copyright notice in the code itself. Although, um, you know, if it's in the source code and you're not disclosing that, and if your commercialization model hopefully is um, SaaS, um, and so nobody even gets your code, they just send data to you and you process it on your servers or in your cloud and send it out, uh, then they never see that. But I should say within the world of copyright, one of the best things to have happened when the world of software is the SaaS model or the ASP model or the platform as a service. I know the IT world likes to change the terminology every few years because that's just the way it is. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, let's see, there's one more, unless we want to move on. Let me just look here. Um, let's see, okay. I'll save the blockchain one for later. One more, how about software that controls the hardware? Do you have separate copyrights for each? And then we'll move on. Software, software. So yeah, um, even embedded software. Um, so irrespective of what the software does, um, you know, everything from the parking app to software that's it's that's actually embedded on a chip to control hardware. Yeah, that's that's all protected by copyright. Even though in that particular instance, I guess it's somewhat tangible, right? Because it's attached to something, but. All right, let's move on for now. All right, on to my favorite category of intellectual property, trademarks. So uh, trademarks uh, serve one purpose, and that is to tell you where goods and services come from. It's to indicate the origin of goods and services. And so they can be, and this list gets longer over time, um, words, designs, uh, the shape of goods, uh, of their packaging. So the Coca-Cola, not just the Coca-Cola that's on the bottle, but the shape of the bottle itself is a trademark. Um, combinations of colors. So MasterCard uh, registers the combination of, um, like it's an orangey, yellow, and red in connection with credit card services. And then more recently, sounds and scents. And uh, this, even more recently, moving images, like a series of, of moving images can be um trademarks uh, if you want to think of a, a sound trademark um you know netflix you know the dum dum that's their sound trademark and uh dolby used to have this thing that it was a sound that would increase in pitch and get louder and that was their sound trademark apparently a uh, harley davidson tried to register the sound of their exhaust you know that pup, 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 but uh, they didn't succeed. Perhaps that was because it was descriptive. It was an expression of something that's actually real, which is uh, which is your exhaust. But so why are they important? I'll rephrase that. Why are they the most important? Um, it's because the goodwill associated with products and companies reside in their respective trademarks. That's a clinical and boring way of saying it. Let me rephrase that. Think of a trademark as a vessel, an empty vessel, a jar. And when you come up with a trademark and you come up with a great trademark, like, like if you go back in history, Kodak, Xerox, more recently, Google, 
Um, these are trademarks that didn't have any meaning. I guess Google meant, you know, to scribble or something like that, but um, they don't have any meaning. And so what the trademark is, is it gets associated with your goods and services. And then over time, the meaning is it fills up with the sum of your customers' experiences. So if you're Apple and over years you consistently put out groundbreaking products that are easy to use, that change the way that we live, um, that and, and, and products that make people camp out two days in advance. I don't know if they still do that, but there was a time when Apple would come up with something and you'd hear, oh, it's people camped out or, you know, outside the Apple store and uh, and they just can't wait. And, and, and then, you know, they release the, the iPad or whatever. Um, that that it, consumer experience, it, 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 it's all soaked up by the brand and the brand becomes the vehicle for that. And then when you put that brand on things, it can either, you know, attract customers or, you know, if you've got a product like, you know, cars that break down a lot, then, it, you know, it has the opposite effect. And so consumers make decisions based on trademarks. In fact, most consumers only remember trademarks. Like you have a company, you, you have an office, you have employees, you have shareholders, you have directors. Your customers don't know any of that. I mean, they may know the people they deal with at your company. They, they know the brand and they know their experience with your goods and services. And so you can sell the company and everybody can quit and then you can have new people and you can move the offices and all that and it doesn't matter um because the brand is the front right it's what people connect those goods and services to so as a result um trademarks are the most valuable um intellectual property assets and there's a company, uh, Interbrand, that does a survey every year, and it's a big deal when they have the unveiling. And and for the last, for the longest time, I think Apple's been the top brand. So this is the the top ten of Interbrand's global brand valuation search. And this is for 2023. There must be a 2024 being released soon. And um, you can see that the Apple logo, the Apple brand, is number one at a half a trillion. And, you know, I was wondering about this the other day because I'm an IP, IP geek and I think about these things. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I wonder if there is another asset on the face of the planet that's worth more than half a trillion dollars, a single asset. Like, that's more than the GDP of some countries. But anyways. So what are the requirements? Um, we know for copyright, the requirement was there was originality and there was that it be fixed. Um, ultimately, the requirements for trademarks are distinctiveness, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment, uh, and then use over time. I mean, you need to, it's a use it or lose it. Uh, you need to use your trademark in commerce, and that's how you keep your rights. And so for goods, use means putting it on the good itself, like Tylenol on the pill or on the packaging or on the bag that you get at the store. And for services, they're intangible. So you can't really mark them, but advertisement, or if it appears, like I'm looking at Zoom on, on the screen that is not my presentation. And so that Zoom is, is like an advertisement. And so that's use. So ownership. Um, ownership is it for trademarks is different than it is for patents and it and different than for trade secrets and for copyright. It's not who thought of it. If you think of Nike and you go into the board when they're just starting the company, you don't own Nike. Nike owns it if Nike registers it or is the first to use it in commerce. And so uh, bear in mind that there's a there are a duality is a duality of rights for trademarks. There are common law rights, which are the rights that you get in common law countries that you get just by using a trademark. And then there are rights you get, which we refer to as statutory rights, which you get for registration. And so it's owned by the first person who either uses the mark or registers the mark. So um, distinctiveness. 
So trademarks management, I mean, there's three parts of it. You need to pick a good trademark, you need to register it, and you need to enforce it. So let's talk about distinctiveness. So one of the re two requirements of a trademark is distinctiveness. What does that mean? It means the ability of the trademark to distinguish your goods and services from those of others. And there are two things that are critical. So I'll reword that. You want to pick a good trademark. What are the two things you need to do? Well, you need to make sure that it's not like the trademark of your competitors. And you need to make sure it's not descriptive. So descriptiveness. Um, if you sell bread, you can't have fresh as your trademark. If you sell cars, even if you're Volvo, you can't have safe as your trademark. That describes aspects of what you're selling. And it's it's contrary, uh, it's an unfair trade practice to try to monopolize something that people need to be able to use. Like Mercedes should be able to say their cars are safe. And so <clears throat> descriptiveness is not good. Um, you can't, you also shouldn't, um, and this is even more intuitive, you shouldn't use a mark that's like that of your competitors. It's very tempting sometimes because if you're trying to be like this big company and you want to and you feel like a small company that nobody knows and you want to be that big company, sometimes it's tempting to have a trademark that makes it almost sound like the other company. And we had that a lot a long time ago um, with software companies that would have like variations of Microsoft, right? Because they wanted to somehow allude to Microsoft, but don't do that. The best marks in the world are the ones that don't mean anything until you make them mean something. And the reasons you don't do it are, are simple. And the main one is, uh, if you use someone else's mark, you're going to get sued, right? So that's kind of a no-brainer. The second one is, um, if you go into the marketplace you're con and your mark's confusing, then you may um, direct your customers to get confused and go to your competitor, right? So you may be losing business. One thing to remember is the trademark rights are specific to goods and services. And so you've got Delta, 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 faucets, um, hotels, and airlines. Nobody's going to go to home hardware, buy a faucet, mistakenly buy a plane ticket. It's a, a much different business. And so um, when you're thinking about a good trademark, it can be something that's used in a different field, as long as that's like a sufficiently different field. You also need to consider connotation. So in 1997, Nike, um, for the Air Flame logo on the back of the running shoe, didn't notice that in Arabic it's spelled Allah, right? And um, putting it on a shoe is not a good thing to do. You'd think they'd learn, but 22 years later, they put an Air Max logo on the sole of the shoe, even worse than on the shoe, on the side of the shoe, on the sole of the shoe, and then the element in the Air Max in the center of it is Arabic or look like Arabic for Allah. So uh, if you're going to go abroad with your goods and services, you want to be mindful of that. So um, once you've picked a good trademark, and we recommend that you don't just pick one, pick a couple, brainstorm, pick three. Because what happens sometimes is that a company will spend a ton of time coming up with a trademark. And before they come talking to us, they do any due diligence, they've socialized it within the company. And suddenly the company has become that trademark. And then it's really hard if we find out that it's a bad mark for whatever reason to talk them out of using it. And then they kind of say like, you know, we could sail the open seas, but we've decided to sail through this narrow passage full of icebergs. It's like, okay, fine. Um, so pick two or three. And so the searching, because we know that there are common law rights through use and that there are statutory rights that you get through registration, you need to search the marketplace to see if people are using it. So you can do that with Google and you need to um, review um, trademark registries. So the USPTO, SIPO, and I'll show you um, the knockout search. This is the one for the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. So the first step is you come up with a good word mark, try it out here, go to the USPTO, try it out here. And if it comes out clear, then we can do some other searches that are a little bit more in depth. And that's the way that you clear the path for what you're using. Um, unlike copyrights, 
registration is really important. Um, the rights you get through registration are, um, are much better than your common law rights. And some countries, there are no common law rights. Um, registration is by country, except the EU, which is 27 member states for the price of one, pretty good deal. Um, and for example, uh, Canada, uh, and this is really an anomaly because um, what happened was during COVID, our examiners went home and then they didn't, they just stopped working. And so right now it takes four years for them to get around to examining a trademark application. Trademark applications are like a page and a half long. So um, kind of an international embarrassment right now, hoping that gets better. Um, but the, the thing to bear in mind is like patents, but perhaps less so, uh, trademark costs add up. You know, the more countries that you pick, the more expensive it gets, the more classes, all that. So you should try to prioritize the countries by the value of their market and the likelihood that your product or, you know, your goods or services are going to be sold there. Enforcement. Um, the government doesn't do that for you. You've got to monitor the marketplace. Um, if you see people infringing your trademark rights, we send out, um, you can ask us or some other lawyer to send out a nasty letter. We call them crapograms. Officially, they're cease and desist letters. That's what they're technically called. And we, we send or respond to cease and desist letters on a weekly basis. It's very common. But the good news is that usually resolves it. One party usually... Uh, backs down or the parties enter into a coexistence agreement so it's not that common to go to court and so to sum up um pick the right trademark shouldn't be descriptive it shouldn't be like your competitors uh, register the trademark use it or lose it and keep an eye out for infringers any questions uh yes to start kevin is asking for startups are there downsides to filing a trademark too early certainly there's the upfront cost but are there other potential costs and liabilities such as opening your company up to legal uh legal challenges or, or which would be a distraction for them no uh it's better to do it as <laughs> soon as possible and that's not just an opportunistic from my lawyer's perspective response um, there is, uh, you'll recall in the early days, the domain names, there was cyber squatting where people would register. What's happening is that there are now increasingly trademark squatters, um, particularly in China, but in some other countries as well. And so, and you can see that it takes a while to get registration. So if you come up with a good mark, if you're reasonably satisfied that um, it's not descriptive and that it's not too much like um, competitors and potential competitors' marks. Um, I'll file the application. Uh, filing it early doesn't make it more expensive. Should. Okay, and um, then Kevin has another follow up around the ten year renewable. So if a trademark's been forfeited, does that mean um, someone can still renew their trademark within the ten year window? Everywhere except the U.S. The cool thing about the U.S. is not only do they require evidence of use when you renew, and I say cool because um, it clears a lot of what we would call the deadwood in the on the trademark register. Um, the U.S. also requires you to prove use between the fifth and sixth year of your registration, and so prove use means you'd have to um, file some specimens of use um, to show that you're still using the trademark. And if you don't do that, then you lose your rights. The way, the way it works in the rest of the world is that um, you can typically renew a registration after 10 years and you don't have to prove use. But here's what happens. Um, you can challenge registrations on the basis of non-use. And, and in Canada, Section 45 of the Trademarks Act, if I pay, I think, $800 to SIPO and say, uh, I want you to um, make them prove they're using the mark, we could do that. Any one of us could do that to anyone on the register. You could do that to Coca-Cola if you wanted to. They wouldn't be happy about it. I don't think anybody would be. But um, and if the then what happens is once you've paid that fee and made the request, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office will send a letter, send a letter to the owner of a trademark registration requiring that they prove that they've used the mark in the last two years. And if they haven't, they lose it. Thanks for answering those questions, Roger. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the um, maintenance fees and how that might 
effect, you know, uh, having to take that kind of cost on early and oh, prove no, that there, you're still yeah. using it and stuff like that. Uh, no, no, there are no maintenance fees for trademarks. Um, okay, uh, okay. Ling, Ling's gonna, Ling can mention maintenance fees. There are maintenance fees for patents. Mm -hmm. um, Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then, and regarding use, I mean, that's a good point, but what happens is that there's a grace period after registration in most, most countries. So if you register, if you file an application to register a trademark in Canada, if it's going to, so that's today in 2024, um, as things currently stand, it's going to be 2028 before it registers. If it does register in 2028, there's a two year grace period. So you file a trademark application today. You don't need to start using it until the next decade. So, geez. Yeah. We're good. Awesome. Thanks. You bet. <laughs> Great. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, I think time for one more and then we can always circle back after. Uh, is it enough to trademark in Canada? What other countries could be worth it and, and in what cases? Um, no, it's not because um, it, it's country by country. And so on occasion, we'll have people that will not register in Canada. They will only register in the U.S. Um, what you do is, again, you, you look at the places you think you're going to sell goods and services. You look at the size of the market. And you look at the size of, like, for instance, Brazil may be big, but they, and they don't have a lot. Uh, you know, it's a poorer country. But the part of the country that is a potential consumer could be bigger than the population of Canada, because I think it's like almost 300 million people or something. So you do that math and you pick your countries. And sorry, there is one more just clarifying when you say pick the right trademark, their, their interpretation is Mahash. The interpretation is it's related primarily to the logo and tagline. That's probably, there's probably more to it. Yeah, there are, there are logos. Um, well, the, the, it's usually a word mark is the most important. So Nike, the word, and then the design is second. So the swoosh and then just do it is the slogan. And so if you have limited money to spend on trademark prosecution, just go with the word mark thing to rem remember about the design marks are that they are um, protected by copyright as well. Words aren't, but remember, if you go back to copyrights and designs and things like that, if they um, if they're original and if there was some skill and judgment required in creating that design, then you may automatically have some protection. All right, let's move on from there. Sorry, Ling. I know I keep doing that to you. I took way too much time. No, no, no worries. It's all good stuff. Okay. Okay, everyone's okay seeing my notes. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm very quickly then going to talk about trade secrets um, and then follow that up with patents. Uh, and the, the thing to bear in mind here, and I think it applies to Roger's presentation as well, you know, this is really only intended to be uh, an overview of the different forms of IP. Um, and there's probably gonna be a lot of more uh, kind of nuances that, uh, that we should uh, could go into um, depending on your uh, particular circumstances. <clears throat> um, now, in terms of trade secrets, uh, these are very often um, used interchangeably with uh, confidential information. Uh, I think properly, uh, trade secret is thought of as a subcategory of confidential information. Um, but for today's purposes <clears throat> and for general purposes, you know, we can kind of treat them as as the same uh, uh, as the same thing. Uh, the, on the screen there, you see the, uh, um, the general requirements to have a trade secret. Um, the, the three there, then you'll, it has to be information that's not generally known. Now, that's not an absolute requirement um, in, in terms of being completely secret. So and it's possible that there may be uh, a number of people that, that kind of generally know your, uh, your, your information, you know, a, a bunch of kind of employees outside. <clears throat> um, that does not necessarily uh, disqualify that for trade secret protection, but it does have to be um, pretty general. Um, the information itself has to have commercial value. 
by virtue of the fact uh, that it is secret. And the third requirement, which is the most important, and we'll spend some time on it later, um, is that reasonable efforts have to be taken in order to maintain the secrecy of that information. Um, now, in terms of examples of trade secrets, um, this can cover different categories. So we've got things like uh, formulas, uh, and, and industrial know-how, you know, maybe you've got an, a manufacturing process or an industrial process, um, and, 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 and you, you have uh, there's information that relates to that process, you know, that could qualify as a trade secret. But on top of that, <clears throat> there are a number of other categories which um, uh, I think could be thought of as business information, uh, including you know, financial information, customer lists, things like that, which do and potentially can qualify as, as a trade secret. And so uh, it, it's not just the one um, sort of traditional uh, category of, of kind of industrial and manufacturing processes. It can cover a lot of other types as well. Now, in terms of advantages of trade secrets, um, I think the most significant advantage is that trade secrets never really expire, uh, or at least potentially they never expire. So to the extent that it remains a secret and, and you're able to, to maintain that confidentiality, um, you know, it can have an indefinite life. Unlike some of the other rights that we'll talk about where you have to go through registrations or, or apply for registration, those have a limited life. Um, but in the case of trade secrets, it, it can be indefinite. Uh, another advantage is that say, uh, again, unlike trademarks and patents, you don't have to apply for that right. Um, you know, you don't have to seek approval or authorization from a government to uh, to, to kind of award you uh, that trade secret protection. And so, from a cost standpoint, it can be very beneficial to uh, to, to protect some of your innovations through trade trade secret protection. And as we can see there. You know, trade secrets can be very successful. I've got a, a number of examples there. You know, the the recipes for uh, uh, for for KFC, uh, Coca Cola, you know, the formula for WD forty. All of these are very successful trade secrets and uh, are very long lasting trade secrets as well. Uh, the the thing to keep in mind here is that you know the when it comes to trade secrets, it we think often think of it as a DIY form of protection. You know the uh, Somewhat similar to uh, copyrights, as Roger was saying, you know, we don't necessarily need to involve uh, you know, lawyers to, to apply for these rights. You know, intuitively, you have a good sense of how to protect something as a trade secret. Now, there are some disadvantages, unfortunately, with trade secrets. Uh, the, one, the biggest one being you know, it, it, that protection is only available to the extent that it is, remains a secret, you know, once you let the cat out of the, of the bag, it's too late. You know, if it's uh, someone has posted that information online, it becomes widely known. Your trade secret is gone, and, it, and it, you know it's evaporated in in, in that instant. Uh, and secondly, you know, you cannot, unfortunately, with trade secrets, prevent um, independent creation. Um, so you know, you you you, <clears throat> you may take decide to take the uh, uh, the approach of protecting something that you've discovered as a trade secret, a competitor may come along and come up with the same development. Uh, you would not be able to prevent that um, if you had uh, just uh, just tried to protect your, uh, your that information as a, as a trade secret. And then secondly, and thirdly, there are many instances where trade secret protection, unfortunately, is not feasible. So if you imagine, uh, you know, maybe you've come up with a, a, a widget, you know, the moment that that widget is in the hands of the customer or, or, in, or in the hands of a competitor, it may be very easy for them to understand how that, uh, how that information works or um, how, how it's embodied. They'd be able to re quickly reverse engineering the, the, the product that you have. And so in those cases, you know, trade secret protection is, is not really uh, uh, viable. Uh, I mean, if you have a, a, a sort of black box solution, maybe you, you could, but it been, but in many instances, if you're dealing with a physical product, um, trade secret protection is it can be problematic. Um, just quickly touch on ownership of trade secrets. Again, you know, we in addition to identifying uh, trade secrets, we obviously want to make sure that the the ownership uh, is is in the right uh, right 
uh, in, in the name of the right party. Uh, again, this is fairly straightforward for, for trade secrets. In the situation, for example, where you have an employee come up with a development or maybe an external contractor uh, come up with development that's, uh, that's suitable for trade secret protection, you want to have suitable contractual terms that assign those rights to, to, to the right party. Uh, and typically it's the, the, in, in the name of the company. Uh, so you have a contractor comes up with, they, they may come up with a solution or a trade secret uh, information they they should uh, uh, they should you should have them uh, kind of assign those rights uh, in some sort of contract whether it's a you know in a contractor agreement or a side contract that specifically says you know now that company X has developed you know this uh, this information we we assign it to uh, you know to company company B uh, and in the case of a trade secret um, aside from clarifying the ownership uh, position it can also help to um to make sure that you bind the other parties involved to again not disclosing it to uh to the anyone outside because you want to maintain that uh, that uh, confidentiality and that, and that uh, nature of, of being a, a trade secret so you want to bind the other parties so that they they will maintain the secrecy of it as well and uh on top of that you want to try to restrict their ability to use that trade secret you know uh, they they may uh, they may then turn around and provide that information to your uh, your competitor. And so you again, you wanna kind of have those types of uh, trade secret provisions in, in whatever contract uh, you have. Um, so what qualifies as reasonable efforts? As I mentioned, you, know, you do have to demonstrate in many instances that you've taken reasonable efforts to treat the information as a trade secret. Um, otherwise, you know, the, it become, it's questionable whether uh, it qualifies for trade secret protection. Um, there's no so hard and fast rule in terms of what is necessary. Um, it kind of really depends on the, um, you know, the nature of the information um, that, that, that that's involved, the, the uh, kind of common or industry practices. Uh, and, and so you really have to kind of evaluate based on what it is uh, uh, what the information is in, in terms of what you have to do. There, there is a uh, certainly a, uh, a strong recommendation, however, to put in place a trade secret management program, um, uh, especially if the, the nature of your business involves a lot of uh, kind of innovations, which, um, which you hope to protect as trade secrets. You, you try to put a program in place to, uh, to manage that, that trade secret protection. So how do we do it? How do we protect these trade secrets? I mean, as I said, the first part, portion, sorry, the first part of this is really identifying what the trade secrets are. And so uh, it's, it's useful to have the people who are working on the, uh, uh, on the secret source uh, memorialize the, the innovations that they come up with. You know, it could be lab books, it could be um, you know, putting together memos from time to time uh, in terms of what the, the discovery they've, they've come up with is, uh, and to be able to keep a record of that. And then once you've developed those, uh, um, th those trade secrets, you, know, you wanna make sure that it's marked and you also restrict access to it generally. And so, um, you know, if it's widely available to, to everyone in the company, you know, then the question becomes, you know, was that ever intended to be a trade secret? So you wanna demonstrate that, uh, that this was this had there was given uh, you know very limited access. We we didn't uh, make it available to everyone. We marked all the documents appropriately. They were, they were stamped. Um, it would have taken you know quite uh, uh, quite extensive efforts on a party to actually get access to it otherwise. And then particularly in in the in the context of uh, computer uh, information, you know there are lots of things we can do to try to again limit. That, uh, that, that access to our trade secrets. So, you know, online passwords, um, uh, uh, limiting access control. Uh, and, and again, even in, in an electronic context, it's useful to digitally mark those, uh, th those trade secrets um, to just to prevent any uh, inadvertent disclosure or, or leaking of that information outside. We often think of external threats when we uh, are kind of talking about uh, trade secrets. You know, the, the sort of industrial espionage type scenarios. 
or you have outside parties hacking uh, into your your systems and trying to steal uh, trade secrets through through uh, laptops and and uh, mobile devices, things like that. But the reality, and that is significant, and certainly there's some very good stories about uh, uh, scenarios where that's happened. But the reality is that the vast majority of trade secret loss uh, happens through employees. Um, it may be intentional uh, maybe you have disgruntled employees that uh, they decide to leak information out uh, to to other parties or, or even uh, put it online um, very often it may be in, in, unintentional uh, you know because of the improper handling of trade secrets uh, it, it leaks out from the company and so this kind of really um, emphasizes why it is important to have a trade secret protection program uh, within the company. And, and this is something that everyone should, uh, you know, all the, all the required parties kind of know what the policy is, how information should be treated, and, and when, when should we be extra careful, uh, you know, when we're working with outside parties, whether it's uh, manufacturers, suppliers, and, and, and people like that. So to the extent you can establish you have a trade secret and you've treated it as a trade secret, there is some enforcement uh, possibilities. So, you know, if you imagine a situation where a, a, a disgruntled employee tries to take some of the company's trade secrets and perhaps uh, sell it to a competitor or, or, or try to establish a new business himself with that uh, trade secret information, um, you, can, uh, you, you can take legal steps to prevent that happening. Uh, as I said, it is dependent on your ability to show that that um, that information was a trade secret. So the reasonable steps that uh, you would have taken, um, you, you have to you have to demonstrate the the fact that you take, took those reasonable steps. But if you you can, then you you can go to court and try to uh, uh, prevent the theft of, of, of those trade secrets. Um, I think it's it may not always be a complete solution. Um, as I say, sometimes where the information has been widely disseminated, the fact that you can demonstrate that it was a trade secret. Um, once the information is out there, it's very difficult to kind of put it back in the bag. And, and so if it's been published online, um, you know, you try it as you might, it will be very difficult to, to try to stop that uh, or to, to recover that as a trade secret. And so that's really it for trade secrets. I don't, uh, uh, I don't have too much else to touch on there. I'm just going to check if there's questions there's one from eva ling but not sure if you want to hold that till after you talk. oh okay I, if you like uh yeah in the interest of time maybe i'll skip off to pants and then we'll okay. we'll circle back and deal with the questions then okay um so on to patents um so usually what we're dealing with here is the company has come up with an innovation um it, it may be something which uh, makes the product uh, work better, it's cheaper, faster. It, it's something which provides a competitive advantage to, uh, to, to the company. Uh, and the goal ultimately here is to kind of stake some territory that, um, that you want to protect for yourself. You, you want to prevent competitors from doing the same thing. Uh, and the problem very often is, uh, you know, so comparing this with the trade secret uh, situation, you know, there's a risk that if you disclose it or make it available to the public, that um, that they can use it themselves, uh, or you can, competitors can make use of it. And so you have to take steps to uh, to protect it. And the, the way to do that really is through the uh, uh, through, through patents. So why patent? So one thing to keep in mind here when we're talking about patents is that these protect inventions. Um, we're really concerned about the functional aspects of, of something. So how something works, how it's done. Um, and, and in that respect, it can be very powerful because you know, we are preventing a competitor from moving into a certain space and, and doing something that, uh, that, that gives us a competitive advantage. And so under a patent, uh, it gives you the right to prevent others from making, using, or selling the, the claimed invention. Uh, you know, so as I say, you're, you're kind of putting stakes in the ground and fencing off some, some territory for yourself. The, the protection that's available, uh, again, it's time limited, but it can be uh, up to 20 years from the date that you file 
for your patent application. So it's a pretty you know, lengthy period of protection and it will give you, if you're successful, it will give you a period of exclusivity that allows you to kind of monopolize um, that, that particular claim, uh, claimed invention. Um, and, but in exchange, what you're doing is you're required to disclose your invention. So in effect, it's a, an exchange with the, uh, with, with the state. You know, in, in return for disclosing and sharing your invention with the public, the state gives you a, a limited period of exclusivity. And in, in do so doing, you know, you've sort of pushed back the frontiers of science. You've made it available for other people to use after that period of, ex period of exclusivity uh, ends. Uh, very quickly, what is a patent? So in essence, uh, a patent really is just a document that describes an invention and how to put it into practice. Um, you know, typically the, uh, the patent would discuss a problem that's being addressed um, uh, and maybe go into some background in terms of what the current state of the art is, how that problem is addressed today, and maybe some of the shortcomings of, uh, of those solutions. And instead, We've discovered a new, uh, a new solution to this problem, and here's how it works. Um, the description of your invention, you, if anyone has a chance to actually read a, a patent or a patent application, um, it can go into pretty excruciating detail sometimes because um, what you have to do in your, uh, your patent application is really teach the reader how your invention works, how to put it into practice, and so it has to be very, very detailed. Um, but at the end of a patent document uh, is the most important part of it. It's the claims. So at the very end, there are a, a, a number of claims which define what you consider to be your invention and what you're applying for, uh, uh, for patent protection. Um, these really are the, as I, as I was talking about, you know, the stakes in the ground, you know, the, the claims will define the protection that, uh, that you're asking for and that if you're successful, um, that the patent office is going to grant you. Uh, very quickly, I will talk about <clears> that there, there is a, th a few. There are a few things that we don't get with a patent uh, uh, to keep in mind. Um, the first thing is you do not always necessarily have freedom to operate. Um, what I mean by that, um, if you imagine a situation where perhaps someone has <clears throat> has patented a table, um, if you come along and uh, work on an improvement, you come up with an with a folding table. Now you may well be able to get a patent for your folding table. Uh, and in and return, you'll be able to prevent a competitor from making that folding table. So that, that's the exclusivity that, that you have. But if in making that folding table, you actually have to uh, make a regular table, which is already patented by someone else, <clears throat> it's a possibility, not always, but there's a possibility that you might infringe the, the original patent for the, uh, for the table. Uh, and, and so just one thing to keep in mind, um, I, I, a lot of folks confuse this uh, in, in practice. The fact that you get a patent doesn't always mean that you're able to freely operate uh, and make that, that patented in, invention. It may be that in doing so, you could infringe someone else's patent. Um, and that the other restrict, uh, limitation to, to patents is that there's no government authority uh, enforcing those patent rights for you. You know, you kind of have to be your own patent protect, uh, your patent police. You have to go to court to to enforce those rights. Um, very quickly, touch on ownership. <clears throat> now, uh, this is a you know a, can be again a very important uh, a thing to 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 look at when you're dealing with uh, patented uh, or patentable inventions. The the general rule is the individual inventor is presumed to be the owner of an invention. And so in the case where a company hires someone else, whether an employee or an outside contractor to work on a, a problem, uh, and that, out, that other person comes up with a solution, which perhaps is patentable, the general presumption is that those patent rights belong to the outside party. Now, there's a um, there's an exception to this. Uh, there's several exceptions, but the most important one being, you know, unless there's an express agreement to the contrary, which in essence means, you know, if you have a contract in place which says otherwise, which says that the uh, 
the in the, the outside inventor um, to the extent that they they come up with a solution that actually belongs to the company. So you need some sort of assignment language, whether it's in the uh, whether it's in the uh, con contractor's agreement or whether it's in the terms of the employee's employment contract that expressly says those rights to the extent that uh, these individuals come up with a solution, these rights um, go to, to the company. There, there's a, a second uh, exception to this. So in the case of where, so in the case of where uh, an employee is hired for the purpose of inventing. So uh, maybe a, a, an R&D person or a, a CTO, someone who was hired uh, and given the responsibility of inventing in that, in that case also, then that employee, uh, where they create something which is patentable, those rights will automatically go to the, uh, the company. But that, that really is only in the context of a, uh, an employee that's hired for inventing purposes. So if you have a salesperson who perhaps uh, having spoken to the, cu the uh, customers comes up with an even better solution and he, and, and he comes up with something which potentially is patentable, those rights don't necessarily go to the company. Uh, and so, you know, the, the sort of takeaway from this is to kind of look at the, uh, the, 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 the contracts that you have, the employment contracts and the consulting contracts uh, and contractor agreements that you might have to make sure that the appropriate uh, IP provisions are, are, are there already. Uh, I'll just quickly outline the steps in obtaining a patent. So, you know, you've, if you develop some, uh, some new technology, um, the first thing to do really is to treat it as a trade secret. So you maintain the secrecy of this. You don't want to widely uh, share this information with the public. You have to treat it uh, with, with some care. Uh, at some point, you may decide, well, okay, well, do I have something which is suitable for patent protection? Uh, and you, you perform an assessment. And I'll go into some of the, um, the requirements for patentability uh, in the next slide. Um, but assuming you have something that is patentable, then at some point you start the patenting process by applying for a patent. Um, you, know, you, you put an application together describing your invention and then you submit it to the patent office. Uh, and then at some point in the future, the patent examiner will pick up your application and examine your application. So that involves typically doing a search to see whether your invention qualifies for patent protection. And if you are successful and you get a registration or a registered patent, then the, the, it becomes an IP asset and you can exploit it in many ways. So you could even, uh, you can sell the patent outright to, to someone else. Um, alternatively, you might decide to, to license those rights to, to different parties. And so, you know, once you've got the right and uh, once you've secured the right, you can uh, deal with it in many, many ways. So as I said, the first thing is really to make sure that your invention is kept uh, secret until you're ready to do something else. Um, and there's multiple reasons for this, but the first one is that uh, you know, to the extent you publicly disclose your invention, uh, if you haven't already applied for a patent for it, then that can preclude you from getting a patent. So, you know, we have situations typically where, you know, maybe you, uh, an inventor has to go to a conference and share details of in, in invention, whether it's for academic purposes or whether it's to, uh, to, to share information with, uh, uh, with uh, outside collaborators. Once that information is publicly disclosed, it starts the patent clock running. And if you haven't already filed a patent application for it, then it's too late. There is a grace period, however, for some jurisdictions. Now, unfortunately, it's not all jurisdictions, but in Canada and the US, you have a one year grace period, um, which means you, know, you publicly disclose your invention, um, you still have one year within which to file an application. Uh, so it's not too late in those jurisdictions with that grace period. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind, as I said, is that there are some jurisdictions which have uh, an absolute uh, requirement. So if you haven't filed an application, it's too late. There are some jurisdictions which have a uh, more limited grace period, maybe six months. Um, again, keep that in mind. But the, the, the risk here is still that if you wait, if you say, oh, I'm, in, I, I'm only going to file a Canadian patent or a US patent, I have a one-year grace period. Uh, I publicly disclosed it at a conference. 
it's fine. I've got another year to do it. Um, the reality is that uh, it may be that you're entitled to apply for a patent, but there's still a risk that a third party may actually beat you to the punch. So if they file an application before you, they've maybe in, in, independently have created the same uh, solution. They would file a patent before you, uh, and then you would be uh, you'd be behind them in in the uh, in the queue, as it were. So one thing to uh, that we advise a lot of clients to do is to try to avoid that situation, <clears throat> that that public disclosure, um, by, for example, using things like confidentiality uh, uh, agreements or non-disclosure agreements. So if you have to disclose, but you disclose it under an NDA, then that that's not public disclosure, and and it doesn't start the uh, the patent clock running. In some instances. Uh, where you can't get an NDA, um, the only way around it really is to try to limit the disclosure so that it's, you know, so so that it's more uh, more restrictive. So rather than say this is how my invention, this is how it works, you know, maybe you talk about aspects of it. You know, you talk about the uh, um, the, the specifications of, of what it can do as opposed to how you do it. And so that there there are some uh, avenues to prevent that patent clock running. Um, but you do have to be careful anytime that you are disclosing your invention um, where you haven't you already filed a patent for, uh, for that technology. Uh, so what do, we what do we need to do to have something which is that's patentable? Uh, and the, these are the general requirements for patentability. Uh, the first one is pretty easy. It just means it's just novelty. So, is your solution, uh, the solution that you've come up with, is it uh, new relative to what's come before? So if someone else has already done it, then your invention probably is, is not new. Um, and that's usually a, a fairly easy uh, question to answer, uh, especially if you're in the industry and you kind of know what the state of the art is and you know what your competitors are doing, um, you usually have a good sense of whether your solution is, is uh, novel or not. The second requirement is the uh, it's typically the the the, uh, the hard question. Um, it's whether something is obvious or not. So, uh, in essence, what that means is so you may have a uh, come up with an innovation, uh, and maybe you found that no one else has done the same thing before, so it's new. But if it's such a small refinement of what is already known, um, it's just a very you know a tweak of, of six existing ideas, then. You know, the, the assertion would be that it's obvious and so it's not uh, doesn't qualify for patent protection. So you know if, uh, going back to my poor example, if you have a four-legged table that someone has patented, uh, maybe you come along and say, I'm going to add two legs to it, make it make it a six-legged table. It's going to be stronger and sturdier. Um, you know yes, that would be new, but that probably is going to be obvious because you know any engineer would know that you could add extra legs to a, 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 a four-legged table to, to make that uh, that contraption more uh, more more sturdy. Uh, third requirement is utility. That's a very easy question to to assess. It it's a very low bar to to, to meet. It just basically means if you've got an invention that has a useful function, uh, so it's not esoteric. Um, and, and it achieves that that function, then then it's probably it probably has utility. And then the final requirement is, or a question that often comes up is subject matter. Um, now, in terms of what the statutory um, uh, definition, uh, you, you have to fall into one of these classes. You know, it has to be an art, a process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, and that traditionally can embody many different things. So maybe a mechanical device or a machine, um, a, a drug product for a pharmaceutical, electronic hardware, industrial and manufacturing processes, uh, maybe chemical compounds and the processes for making those chemical compounds. All these are traditional uh, subject matter which fits into these categories. Uh, and more recently, um, we have things like computer software and business methods, which are now also um, uh, which are, are very, very uh, commonly um, so applied for as, uh, through through patent protection. In the case of computer software, uh, yes, you can get patents for computer software, um, but you have to overcome a. In most jurisdictions, you have to overcome a presumption that that is abstract subject matter. So, uh, because very often you're you're dealing with ones and zeros, you're manipulating data in some form. 
the presumption is that that's abstract because nothing physical is happening. Um, but you can get around that with with um, uh, with some uh, sort of detailed drafting to explain why it's more than that. So if you have an, a, a computer or software invention which achieves a physical function or some sort of real world effect, then then you know then it is something can, that can still uh, potentially be be patented. Uh, in the case of business methods, uh, those are uh, becoming very very difficult to 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 get patents for. Um, but nevertheless, you know, the, these are all the types of uh, or examples of different types of, uh, uh, of, of things that can qualify as sub, uh, subject matter for patent protection. Uh, I, I'll just skip. There are a few exceptions that we can't apply for things like uh, scientific principles. So, you know, e equals MC squared. That's a discovery, but you know, you can't actually patent that. Or if you've got uh, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, those those are math mathematical uh, uh, discoveries. You know, you can't uh, patent that uh, that solution either. Uh, the patenting process starts usually with preparing and filing an application, and then, as I mentioned, you know, it goes through the examination uh, stage at some point in the future. It may be. Uh, a year and a half, two years or more down the road, but at some point it gets examined by an examiner. So the examiner does a search to determine whether the uh, the invention that you've applied for, whether it meets those patentability requirements. Is it novel? Uh, sorry, is it novel? Is it useful? And is, and, and is it uh, uh, non-obvious? And so you'll get an assessment from that examiner. Uh, hopefully it's it's positive and and, and uh, you know they were not able to find anything uh, that that was an obstacle but in mo most cases you'll get a response back which says you know hey I found these uh, other patent applications that other people have applied for I think it's very similar uh, and, and I think uh, you you should be uh, you shouldn't be allowed to get a patent for that and so that gives you an opportunity then to kind of argue and explain uh you know, why perhaps the examiner has has uh, been uh, uh has, has been misled you know maybe he's misconstrued the 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 application that that uh, you have for your technology maybe he's misunderstood the uh the the, the patents that he's citing against you and so uh you have an opportunity to kind of overcome that uh, that initial objection uh, and if you can't overcome that objection sometimes you can actually amend your application to cover something you know, maybe you, have, you applied for something very broad. If you can amend that application to something very narrow or more narrow, maybe that will be enough to uh, avoid that uh, uh, that prior art. And then hopefully at the end of the day, you get to your registration. Um, now, everything starts with that first filing and putting that application together. Uh, and typically we find, especially with, um, uh, with, with clients who are fairly tech savvy, sometimes they can help with that process. You know, they can put, together a, a background of what the problem is and, and why that uh, their particular solution is able uh, to, to, to solve that, uh, that problem. And so once you've got that application, you, you send it into the patent office and that you get a timestamp as a result of that, you've got your filing. And that's where the, the, you may encounter uh, markings from time to time where, where folks say, oh, we've got a patent pending on this. And so once you've filed an application, you, you, you get the you, you get a filing date and that allows you to more freely disclose your invention to the public. Um, one much like uh, trademarks, we were talking about trademarks earlier. So patents are territorial or jurisdictional too. So if you get a Canadian patent, it will give you protection within Canada, but unfortunately it doesn't do you any good in, in Japan or in, in China or elsewhere. So you really have to think about where you want protection and, and where, where, where uh, which countries to, to consider at least uh, filing protection for. The, the problem, of course, uh, same as in the trademark scenario, if you look for or seek protection in many countries, it can get pretty complicated uh, and, and pretty expensive. Uh, but there are certain mechanisms that we can make use of to try to um, do that more efficiently and more cost effectively. So the first thing is that there's something called a priority that uh, a priority claim that you can make. So if you file a first application somewhere in the world, let's say in the US or in Canada, um, you're, that entitles you to claim priority of that first application when you file a second application within one year. So you file an application, let's say in Canada today, 
you can file a second application in Japan one year later, and you get to effectively backdate that Japanese filing as though it was filed uh, on the day that you filed the Canadian application. So this can kind of uh, buy you some additional time. You know, you file your first application and then you go to market and, and try to see whether the, whether the, um, the invention uh, has good commercial reception. And so, you know, only then do you decide, okay, well now, now this invention clearly has legs. I'm going to invest a bit more money in, 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 and uh, maybe seek protection elsewhere. Yeah, and this is a great, very uh, simple technique to defer some of the costs. Um, in the case of the US, there is a opportunity to file a, uh, a provisional application. It, this is a um, sort of watered down version of a regular patent application. It allows us to cut a few corners uh, and as a result, it can reduce the cost somewhat. Uh, and so as a result, you know, it allows you to put a first application on file fairly quickly um, and fairly inexpensively. Uh, and that can still form the basis of the priority claim that you might want to make within 12 months. Uh, and then <clears throat> it, to the extent you consider uh, international protection for your, uh, for your uh, invention, uh, there, there is something called a PCT or an international application. Uh, what this allows you to do is to file one single application that basically covers most of the major industrialized countries. I think it's about 150 plus countries uh, that, that that's covered. Um, and, and what it allows you to do is on the basis of that one international application is that you can then roll that over or convert that into a uh, national patent application in countries of your choosing. So you might in, at some point in the future decide, okay, I've got an international application filed. Now I'm going to file a, uh, now I want to seek protection in Japan and in, uh, in Europe and in England, uh, sorry, in the UK, you can then nationalize it or, or convert that into a national application in Japan, UK, and, and, and in, uh, in Europe. So it, 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 uh, that makes things very efficient. Um, and then also more importantly, perhaps for many startups, it defers the cost of having to file uh, those patent applications in those countries of interest. Uh, and you can defer that decision up to two and a half years. Uh, and so again, in, in the same way that the priority claim bought you an extra year, in this case, it can buy you another one and a half years or two and a half years in total before you have to decide to file patent applications in, in all those countries of interest. Um, and so just as an example, this is a very common filing strategy for, um, for a company that, that has an invention that they want to widely protect in, in, in many countries. And so you file a first application somewhere. If you look at the left side there, you have your first filing. Um, but if you follow that up with a PCT or international application within 12 months, you get to make a priority claim and backdate it uh, and preserve that protection. And then two and a half years down uh, in the future, that's when you need to decide whether to file national applications or convert that into a national application in the countries of your choosing. And so that's a very powerful strategy um, and very <clears throat> can be a fairly cost-effective strategy when you're considering uh, protection in multiple countries. So that's in essence it. I have a number of takeaways in this. And, and if I, I think uh, Angie said that uh, she was gonna make this available to everyone. So I'm not gonna go over a bunch of takeaways. These are really sort of tips to uh, perhaps treat as a checklist to go through uh, your own IP portfolio to the extent you, you've developed one and figure out, oh, have I done this? Uh, so you can take away, take that away and, and kind of maybe go, go through some of those questions and, and see whether you, um, you know, potentially have any issues or, or, or whether you've kind of done, uh, you know, you put all the, the, uh, the ducks in order already. So I will stop there and see if we've got any questions okay thanks Ling. we do have some questions i'll go through some online ones first and i think someone's got their hand up too if you uh don't have any questions and can't stick around thanks for joining us um next friday june 7th as part of vancouver startup week we will be doing a session with innovate bc called the business case for ip and ling will be one of the speakers on that panel so if you want to see ling in the in person you can check out that event um, and you can get that on the Vancouver Startup Week website. Um, I think we have a promo code to get a discount. So if you need one of those, just reach out to us and we'll, we'll set you up with all of that. 
So yeah, if you're out of here, thanks for joining us. Otherwise, let's dig into some questions here. So Eva is asking, this is an interesting one. Um, so many tech companies are advised to go the trade secret route instead of applying for patents, which are published. But at VC stage, they are asked about their patent IP. So what do you do? Yeah, so I think, the, well, the, 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 the thing about patents is that to and trademarks uh, when you go for registration is that those are pretty well understood by the investment community and for, you know, even if it's a, a large company that uh, perhaps considering buying, uh, buying you outright, you know, those things are, are pretty well understood. Um, and they provide a lot of comfort to these investors or, or finance companies because, um, you know, because you've got a, you've got a moat in effect of protection. And so, that provides a lot of additional comfort to you know investing in you and your business. They've, they've you've got now got uh, uh, a degree of protection that will come with it as well. And so that's kind of why uh, patents are very uh, attractive and and also why they can be so powerful. Um, obviously, when it comes to costs, that that is you know one of the the considerations for why you might uh, take uh, the the trade secret route. Um, you know, the, the, the risk of trade secrets is that they are very fragile. You know, as, as I said, you, 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 if you take the trade secret route, the, the moment that that is widely known or generally known, then you no longer have a trade secret. And so your, uh, your, your trade secret is no longer. Uh, and so how can we value that, uh, that, that protection and what comfort is that going to give us? So that's the, the, the sort of the other side of it. The, 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 the solution uh, practically, is that I always think of uh, IP protection as a bit of an onion. So you have multiple layers. So it may be that some part of your, you know, maybe you've, you've developed, developed a new, I don't know, a, a compression technology, let's say. Um, you know, you may be able to kind of couch some of that uh, and protect it as a patent, but there may be some, uh, some, uh, you know, some know-how that you keep in the back as, and you protect that as a trade secret. And so, you know, rather than relying on one and uh, and and kind of disregard the other, you know, if you if there are often made ways to uh, seek, you know, protect. You kind of hedge your bets if you like. Um, you know, you 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 seek uh, protection in uh, for patents for some of it, but then you know you you keep some of it as as a trade secret. Great. Uh, and on the trade secret front, if you have your trade secrets on a Google Drive that's private, was that qualify? Uh, that's from Ben. So where I'm, I'm seeing that one. Oh, yeah, fine. okay to keep trade secrets on a Google Drive shared only with people who are supposed to have access to the secrets. But then, yeah, I think someone else mentioned that Google technically has access. <laughs> that's well, yeah, yes, exactly. That that's yeah, you know, the, uh, you know, this kind of re-emphasizes my point that uh, you know, trade secrets are very fragile and vulnerable. Um, you know, you. You, there, there is no hard and fast rule in terms of what you can do, but the more layers you can put in, if you decided that trade secret is, is what you want to do, you know, the, the more complications you can, uh, complexities you can add to it, the better. So, um, you know, my KFC example, you know, I think what they did was pretty elaborate. Um, you know, they had uh, two employees, oh, that one so two employees that knew parts of the formula, the recipe. You know, one knew half the recipe, the other knew the other half, and, and that was it. And then they had, uh, I think part of the recipe was written in a uh, written down and put in a safe, but only one employee had access to the combination of that safe. And so, you know, you can you can go go uh, you know pretty uh, pretty crazy and and make it very complicated. But uh, it will uh, you know the the more layers you're able to to put in, then usually the the, the better. Okay, a couple more patent questions, and then we have some broader questions. Um... If I already have a patent registered in the U.S., how many years um, do oh. I have? Oh, uh, now when when you say uh, this is Juan, yeah. uh, when when they have a they say they have a patent registered. Now, if, if they've already registered in the U.S., then generally speaking, it may well be too late to seek protection elsewhere for the same invention. Um, so, and the reason is because you know when when they applied for the patent in the U.S they will have disclosed it in that application and it would have been published. Uh, and so if you today now go to uh, seek patent protection in, in, in some other jurisdiction, that US application can get cited against you as prior art. And so, you know, you, if it's the same invention, you know, you're, you're probably out of luck um, in, in getting that corresponding protection. 
um, if you've got improvements, you know, you, you may still be able to uh, get prote protection for the, the improvements. But if it's the same technology, exact same invention, then it, it may well be too late. Okay, and that's a good thought. Armin's is the last question there, Lang, that's kind of is related to what you just said. But... Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a pretty common strategy. So, uh, you know, you, you may have kind of developed improvements or refinements to uh, something which is patented today. Um, but if those were not obvious, um, then those improvements could, could uh, be the subject of a separate patent uh, application. Okay, there are a couple more questions from earlier I'll look up, but oh. I think Sala had a had their hand raised. I'm not sure if Sala's still there, but if you want to speak, Sala, please go ahead. I think he's coming. Or she's coming. Hi. Oh, maybe not. So I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. What is the difference between uh, patent and international patent. I mean, I have a license patent and I want to uh, get an international patent. Uh, what's the requirements for, I mean, international patent? Oh, so if it's, it's I think that sounds a little somewhat similar to the, the early question, but um, now, for a, let's say you, uh, if you apply for a patent in Canada, um, if you if you go through the process successfully, you'll get a Canadian patent. Now, the the international patent I was referring to um, is not strictly speaking a, the same as a patent. Um, it's a filing mechanism, really. So it's a mechanism that uh, makes it easier for applicants to apply for patent protection in other countries, uh, and so. The international application doesn't get examined in the same way that a national uh, a Canadian patent would be would would be examined. So you use it as the basis for an application, but at some point in the future, remember uh, as I said, that two and a half year period afterwards, you get to convert that international application into a national application of your choosing. So you might would decide, I filed this international application. Now I'm going to convert that into you know, a, 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 a Japanese patent or a, sorry, a Japanese patent application um, or a European patent application. The, the, the international patent uh, unfortunately doesn't exist. It'd be great to, to get that, but, uh, but we currently, at least we, we, there is no international patent per se, but there's only a international patent application um, uh, process that, that we can make use of. All right, uh, back to the topic of copyright. Uh, Brian was asking about um, low code tools. So if someone uses a low code platform that generates the code, uh, what are the copyright issues there? Um, I'm not too familiar with low code. It sounds somewhat analogous to AI where you're using a tool. Um, generally speaking, and the law on AI specifically is not settled, but the low code, it's the person who uses the um, tool in order to make um, software that owns the copyright in the resulting software. So again, the same concerns regarding make sure there's a waiver of moral rights in the employment agreement, and if you're dealing with third-party contractors where the uh, the company isn't um, automatically deemed to be the owner, make sure you've got words of assignment. So the same principles apply. Yeah, I think there was an earlier question on Copilot as well. I, I can't remember. I, I remember seeing it, but I think that again, that's a similar sort of situation where if you have uh, something like Copilot generate some sort of content for you. Uh, again, the same sort of principles apply. But if you look at the uh, for example, in the case of uh, ChatGPT, I, I seem to recall that their licensing provisions um, kind of specify that any content that's generated as a result of using ChatGPT belongs to the, you know, the, 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 there's a requester that, that sort of runs, through, runs it through the, um, uh, through, yeah. through the program. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the, so the, in this case, the, the, the person would be entitled to certainly use it and that there, there probably wouldn't be any restrictions per se in, in terms of uh, copyright. All right, and then one final question and then we'll call it a day here. Another kind of copyright 
general question. Uh, thoughts on the impact of blockchain regarding the evolution of copyright protection? That's from Ben. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank. Um, the reason is my understanding of blockchain is that it's a system that, uh, that takes certain aspects of code or at least certain identifiers or and spreads stuff out. So it, in and of itself, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't create the content. It's a system where content that's already been created is distributed across the internet in a way to make it more secure. And so that being the case, we're not talking about a new work. Um, if there is a new work developed, the starting point would be that the person using the technology would be the author, but you'd have to look, as Ling noted, to the terms and conditions of the blockchain technology you're using uh, to see if the blockchain, and it would be very surprising if um, a blockchain service provider were to have terms that were like, were grabbed at their customer's IP, right? That's kind of bad for business. Yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, I think of that, uh, that the, so the blockchain really has a sort of uh, as a special kind of database, really. And so I think uh, in terms of creating new content, I, I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not really sure of the scenario in which that, that would actually create uh, uh, new content and certainly not copyrightable content. Okay, awesome. Well, let's leave it there. Thanks for all the great questions, everyone. Thanks to Ling and Roger for stick handling them all for yet another year. It's been a great, great to uh, content uh, and uh, speakers for us for a long time so very Thank much you. appreciate it our pleasure yes uh and um what else can i tell you oh the slides will be posted we'll send you a link and we'll send a link to the video as well in case you need it otherwise i think that's a wrap thank you again ling and roger and faskin and everyone else have a Perfect. wonderful day. thanks everyone good luck on the uh, the competition thanks Thank you. yeah good luck Thank you. bye thanks everyone